So we'll now start the virtual MDT. Uh, uh, before we go on to the virtual MDT, we'll just go through some of the MCQs that uh, uh, the, our participants have had to solve. And I'll very quickly go through the answers in the interest of time. Uh, the first question was, uh, in patients who get radical radiotherapy, what was the reason why we had androgen deprivation therapy? And I think this has been very adequately and nicely covered by both uh, PRAPS and ASH. And the answer to that is the ADT limits activation of radiation-induced DNA repair genes. Uh, the next question was, and which of the following statements about bone scan are false? And this is a slight trick question because there were two false answers in this. One was the super scan is defined when the radio tracer concentration is in the bo bones and the kidneys. But the, um, a super scan, the tracer is not present in the kidneys because all of it's been taken up by the bones and nothing uh, goes on to the kidneys. The next question was molybdenum has a very short half-life. Uh, it has a long half-life. That's because technetium has a short half-life and it's quite metastable. So molybdenum, which is a precursor of technetium, is often used to transfer uh, technetium. The next question was, which of the following statements is fa false? And there are a number of uh, different aspects of metastatic prostate cancer in this. But the key one was biclutamide offers castration. Biclutamide doesn't offer castration. It's an anti-androgen. The testosterone levels are still maintained. The final question is, what is the definition of oligometastatic prostate cancer? And there is no uniform agreement. Uh, there is some variation in this. But widely, uh, if it's uh, most literature would say three or five meds with no visceral organs or more than three different organs involved. It's somewhat complicated because the definition of oligometastatic disease can also be dependent on the imaging modality that you use. So uh, a little controversial there, but yet very interesting. I'll now go on to our... Uh, well, I'll just make a comment on the definition of oligometastatic disease, Bhavan. Yes, so, okay, sorry, just, just to say, absolutely. So I think the best definition now that's emerging is probably what Stampede has shown because of what it showed in terms of um, what has prognostic value. So we know that the RTM1 study showed a benefit for people that had, uh, and we did, sorry, there was a subgroup analysis of that based on the number of METs that they had. And we actually showed that the benefit uh, was based on if they had four or fewer extra pelvic nodal or bone metastases. So there are no visceral mets. So if you have a visceral met, by definition, it's not oligometastatic. Uh, you're allowed to therefore have up to and including four extra pelvic nodal or bone metastases at any site. And so that is the definition of oligometastatic disease that Stampede, I guess, is going to take forward. And so that, I think, will probably uh, emerge as, as, as what, is, uh, what will have consensus. Uh, P.S., just a follow-up from that since we've started this debate. Uh, what do you think about the imaging modality that defines uh, oligometastatic disease? Uh, because we know both per patient and per lesion analysis vary depending on the imaging modalities that we use. Absolutely. So, for example, you know, the average patient that has three bone mets on a bone scan may have five or six on a PSMA PET. So you'll end up up upstaging people if you use novel imaging modalities like PSMA PET. So if you look at the stampede criteria, it was based on conventional imaging, bone scan and cross-section imaging with CT scan. Uh, and that is what was shown to be prognostic in that RTM1 uh, study. So basically going forward, the stampede viewpoint has been that we should continue using those standard care modalities because they've been shown to be prognostic. So I think, you know, a patient that has six bone metastases on a PSMA PET, but only has three on a bone scan, with those three being, you know, extra pelvic with no visceral metastases, et cetera, would be considered oligometastatic, at least by stampede terms. But the problem is if you start, if you start increasing the number for PSMA PET, you're doing it in an arbitrary fashion because you don't know whether that actually has any has any relevance in terms of survival benefit. Whereas if you use conventional modalities, which is what the large phase three trials have all done, like Stampede, and you show that that has, uh, that's the definition you're using, then that at least has some rationale prognostically in terms of survival. So, so I think, you know, Pearson A. Pet, uh, as Meads beautifully illustrated and others have, have shown, is, is a brilliant tool 
But in terms of de defining between high and low volume, I personally think we should stick to what has been proven to have some survival prognostic uh, impact, which is conventional imaging with CT and bone scan. I, I just like to break my own rule about the questions because this is quite an interesting topic. And, uh, and I'd just like to follow up with another question, Piers. Now, metastasis directed therapy, you know, the, what we're really trying to achieve is see if we can delay hormone therapy, perhaps alter the natural history of the disease and potentially increase uh, cancer specific survival. Yet, if we don't standardize the imaging, how do, how do we know for sure that we are dealing with the same group of patients if the, uh, the imaging has not been standardized? I think this, so the imaging will be standardized in, in the next stampede arm because it will all be based on, say, on standard care, bone scan and CT imaging. I think the more difficult question is, is what you do if people then also have novel imaging which shows different sites of metastases because then do you irradiate those or not? Because, because, the, because then, you're in a, then you've got a very heterogeneous cohort. So the stampede viewpoint, as far as I understand, is that the the lesions have to be seen on standard care imaging for you to have uh, for you to uh, treat them with metastasis directed therapy. So at least we know at the end of the study whether um, standard care imaging defines all of, that defines all of the disease and whether treatment directed to those metastases improves survival. We cannot therefore make any judgments about whether or not you could do this kind of Pokemon approach of treating every single thing that you, every single hotspot you send a PSMA pet. Because of course, we don't even know if all of those hotspots in a PSMA pet are relevant. We don't even know if they're all metastases. So that's why, that's why I think we need to standardize the imaging with what is widely available, at least across the UK. As you know, 95% of current stampede um, patients get bone scan and CT with only 5% getting novel imaging on top. So we, we, this is a, this is a trial that potentially can, you know, will of course be able to recruit across the UK where bone scan and CT are still widespreadly used and, and one which is based upon the foundation that that is what has prognostic value. So I think adding in novel imaging uh, just complicates the question. Sure. Fantastic. Piece. I'll, I'll now head to the virtual MDT. Uh, so uh, uh, if we could have all members on board now. So the first case is a 70-year-old gentleman. He's got a PSE of 10.5. He's on finasteride. His uh, digital rectal examination was a malignant feeling prostate. Very fit man, good performance status. Ran a marathon a couple of months back. He's got significant low urinary tract symptoms with poor emptying and is currently reliant on ISC. And his uroflowmetry shows an obstructive flow. This is his MRI scan. You can see the T2 image. On the left side, there's a dark spot there. On his diffusion weighted images, it becomes black. On his ADC, on, a, on his ADC again, you can see some darkness there. Sorry, on the diffusion image, it becomes bright, and you can see a sagittal image. So, Marco, if I can ask you to come in here, well, this Marco. is like a quite clear. I would I would say a PT, uh, definitely a PT3A um, tumor, and it, it, I, if I can see it, is definitely a Parrish five. So not the best. The best, the best yeah. radio ra, ra, interpreter of, of MRI, but yeah, definitely. Yeah. Our, our radiologist agreed with you. The man's relatively young. His PSA is around 10 on finasteride. Would you proceed with the biopsy? And if yeah. so, what kind of biopsy would you do, Mark? Uh, I come from Italy. We are still a tra transrectal country, but I definitely prefer transperineal. Uh, I think it's much more cleaner and more precise. Uh, okay. regardless of where you do it uh, with any any kind of fusion, but, you know, cognitive fusion, transperineal is the way. I, I, this is my preference at the moment. Okay. Just a little bit more to add on this. He's got a long urethral length. He's got no disease around the urinary sphincter. Uh, so for all his preoperative parameters would suggest that continence, if prostatectomy was a preferred option, would be good with this gentleman. And on rectal examination, it felt like the prostate was resectable. So his histology comes back as a Gleason 9, grade group 5 prostate cancer, very adverse features, pretty much all cores involved. We did a bone scan on him. Sumit, would you like to comment on this bone scan? Uh, yes, yeah. So here we have a bone scan of a patient uh, with prostate cancer. So 
two foci of increased MDP uptake is seen, one on the right acetabulum and one in the L5 or 4, L4 vertebra. So two foci probably metastatic in uh, nature only. Okay. So we proceeded with the CT and this confirms sclerotic uh, areas in, this, uh, in, the, in the same areas that the bone scan should. Uh, and so by definition, this is a low volume metastatic disease. There is some variability depending on the studies that you see, but I think in, we are all in consensus that this is low volume metastatic disease, and this would be staged as T3N not M1B, okay, because there is no visceral involvement. So M1B, B for bone, bone metastasis. So now the discussion points. Uh, Ash, can I come to you? What would your choice of hormones be in this gentleman and why? I think he is uh, uh, suitable for both uh, agonist and antagonist um, uh, therapy. The the things I would push me to as antagonist would be if we were worried about him going into blood output obstruction or worried about spinal cord compression, low volume METs probably not uh, as concerning but not unheard of for them to also develop a cord compression. Um, so both options are fine uh, as long as we use an antiandrogen with the Elisharish uh, agonist. Okay. Uh, Raj, if I can come to you, uh, uh, what would your choice of hormones be in India uh, for this patient? Yeah, I think uh, uh, in India, the almost the same uh, uh, management. So we uh, either give, uh, do bilateral arthritectomy or we go for injectable hormones, either analogs or antagonist. But in this situation, if we plan for uh, only hormonal treatment along with uh, either the abiraterone or enzalutamide, then we go ahead with the bilateral arthritectomy, which is much more common. Uh, uh, if, you, if you ask me why bilateral arthritectomy is very common in India, so there are a few reasons. Number one is that uh, the, the injectables, they are all very expensive, not covered by insurance. So although in private setting, so I think we have almost now around 60% of them go for uh, injectables, whereas 40% choose uh, arthritectomy. And in government uh, setting, so almost I can say 99-100% uh, they go along with uh, bilateral arthritectomy. This if you choose this patient for a permanent hormonal ablation. Suppose if we plan for any local treatment and we want to give only for a specific period of time, then uh, we go for uh, injectables. In injectables, if I would prefer, uh, as PSB discussed earlier, I would prefer antagonist. Uh, the reason being he already has a severe LUTS. So I think it will be better with the antagonist uh, until for a short period of time. Uh, just going on from what uh, Dr. Yuraj said, uh, in the one of the questions that we got from our participants was that what are the implications of the permanent or irreversibility of orchidectomy? And I think Dr. Yuraj covered it very nice. In situations where you have non-metastatic prostate cancer or high-risk prostate cancer, which is non-metastatic, where we, you would give hormones and radiotherapy, uh, you know, you don't want permanent uh, hormonal treatment. It is for a period of treatment. So in that situation, uh, non-surgical castration is not an unreasonable option. Uh, going on to the next question, we have three options in, in terms of upfront systemic options. There is enzalutamide, Abbey, and docetaxel. Some of the decisions that we make are based on COVID-19. And this was another question that we had from one of our participants. How have we altered our management because of COVID-19? So if I can ask Shea and uh, Jeshri to opine on this, please. So um, thanks, Bhavan. So in the COVID context, um, in the first wave especially, so we have uh, significantly reduced or avoided using docetax so for patients with high volume metastatic disease. So this man is 70 years old. He's got high volume, high grade, high risk, uh, more legal metastatic uh, if, I if I could interrupt you, this was low volume. Yeah, this is low volume, I understand. So the choice would be offer this man definitely combination treatment with long-term ADT plus uh, additional agent, in this case, ENZA or RB, as they both have shown um, benefit in low-volume disease patients. In addition, being a, a radiation oncologist, I would offer him um, local treatment with uh, 36 gray in six weekly fraction radiotherapy 
like my man in a presentation, he's got a very ad adjacent pelvic um, metastasis. It is very tempting to include that in the volume. In terms of the spine lesion, I know um, many radiation oncologists would also treat um, if there's only two in together or both in pelvis. It's easily done with the um, IMIT technique and toxicity is extremely low. So you would consider this person for radiotherapy to the prostate and metastasis directed uh, radiotherapy or stereotactic radiotherapy to the spine tray? Is, is that the summary? No, not necessarily a stereotactic uh, radiotherapy. Certainly it is an option if you have the technology to do that. But if you were treating prostate with high pole fractionated uh, radiotherapy, which is not stereotactic. It's 36 grain, six weekly fraction, which is one um, regime adopted in Stampede trial. So you can treat at the same time uh, like what uh, I have um, demonstrated in my case presentation. Okay. Just one more thing. This man's got very bad low urinary tract symptoms and he's ISC dependent. Would you like for his low urinary tract symptoms to be optimized with some form of bladder outlet surgery before you offer him radiotherapy? Absolutely. I'm glad that you offered. Otherwise, I would have knacked in the MDT. <laughs> Excellent. I'd like to now go to both Dr. Yuraj and PS to uh, say, what do you think about radical prostatectomy? We, we know that the evidence is not mature at the moment. Uh, would you consider this and would you do this as part of a trial or would you offer it as standard practice in clinical practice? P.S. if I could ask you first, please. Um, so I was hoping you'd ask Dr. Yuvraj first, because uh, I think hear his opinion. But uh, my opinion is, uh, yes, I mean, I think you'll kill two birds with one stone, potentially. You'll deal with the local treatment to the prostate. There's no evidence really that, you know, I accept there's no evidence for surgery specifically in local therapy like there is with radiotherapy, but in all <laughs> other situations, surgery and radiotherapy appear to be equivalent. So I don't really think there'll be a big difference even if you were to do surgery or radiotherapy in terms of oncological uh, effect. But of course, surgery has its own morbidities. And of course, you know, the other advantage for surgery in this situation is because it kills two birds with one stone. Not only does it deal with the local therapy argument, but it also gets rid of the, the low urinary tract symptoms rather than you having to go do a TURP and recover from that and then you have to do radiotherapy. So you, you kill two birds with one stone. So to me, it is, it, is a, it is a viable option if a man is well motivated, if he's fit, if he's going to do his perth throw exercises. And if I say, as I said earlier in my talk, if you can be fairly confident, you can do it without complications or by, or making him wet based on his MRI scan, based on his, the length of his sphincter, et cetera. Uh, Dr. Yuraj, uh, what do you think, Dr. Yuraj? Yeah, I, I think it's the same uh, uh, answer. I think uh, we don't have any clinical trials running, so we have to uh, either treat it uh, according to whatever we feel it is comfortable and if the patient is uh, very well motivated and as you told that his patient is very well fit and uh, you know he has got at least 10 years of life we can i can if i can uh, imagine uh, i think a, a form of local treatment either radiation therapy or radical prostatectomy we uh, explain to the patients and uh, i think adt plus radical prostatectomy in this case if you see mri is only the left side which is involved I think mainly so i think uh, uh, on mri but although biopsy shows uh, many other course I think it's a, it's a fair uh, uh, you know treatment to give a surgery for this particular patient. Interesting. So I'll let you know what we did. Uh, so we stopped this finasteride. Uh, we started them on decapeptal six monthly injections. We started them on insulotomide. Uh, what I didn't tell you was that he did have a lot of sphincteric involvement uh, for the sake of discussion, and he had a very short urethral length. So we decided that uh, perhaps he his outcomes from surgery may not be very good. So we offered him a bipolar TURP, which he did reasonably well for. And we wait around three months before we would offer him radiotherapy, but that's the plan. Uh, would all of you agree that this was a reasonable strategy? Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. Can I ask why? what, what was the choice of enzalutamide instead of abiraterone or docetaxin? 
I think it comes down to what licensing we have in UK. Uh, we know that enzalutamide has been approved and Abbey hasn't been. And in the COVID era, we feel a little uncomfortable with using uh, systemic chemotherapy with docetaxel. I'd like, uh, I'd like Shea and uh, Jeshri if they could comment on that as well and see if they agree with me. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, um, abiratrone is not NICE approved yet for this indication, so we've only got access to enzalutamide. Excellent. So, 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 so that's about cost, right? So if this was a private patient and you could do what you like, uh, would you then offer abiratrone instead of enzalutamide? So um, from uh, my perspective, based on the evidence presented, we widely view Abby and Enza as equivalent efficacious drug. So this is part of the reason why uh, Enza was uh, approved, but Abby not. Another reason we all speculate is that um, in the COVID era, abiratron is co-administered with prednisolone because of this um, adrenal effect with a lot of um, monitoring required. For example, after initiation, you will require blood test in two weeks and then four weeks, a lot of intensity in terms of uh, healthcare contact. Uh, as well as uh, potential complication management. Excellent, Shea. Excellent, I mean, this this is uh, Shea makes some very good points there, and uh, uh, I'd like. To, there was a question that was asked to us by the participants, how have we changed our practice in the COVID era? So one is the choice of systemic therapy. Uh, secondly, I'd like to just make a quick mention of why we use six monthly decapeptal injections, because we used to use three monthly preparations previously, but to reduce healthcare contact, we've now changed to six monthly preparations just to have as minimal contact with, uh, with healthcare. Can I just make one final um, comment and maybe Shea Jayshree can comment more, but maybe it's worth mentioning the PEACE-1 trial here because presumably this patient would be eligible for that sort of a trial. Of course, that's a European trial, but he could therefore receive an arm which included both abiratron and uh, docetaxel and, um, you know, or an arm that, was, that had, um, uh, you know, ADT with those taxes. So he, there are lots of different potential combinations, right? Where you don't have, doesn't have to be Dosi or Abby or Enza, but there could be some kind of combination of those drugs. Is that correct? I would agree with that. Um, the only thing about this man with docetaxel is, you know, from chartered and stampede trial, he would be defined as a low volume, um, you know, disease burden. Therefore, the the confidence interval was cross one at 1.07. Um, so given the toxicity and one important fact I haven't mentioned because of the uh, limitation in time is that quality of life. The ASCO GU this year had an important slide showing that quality of life with patient on Abbey is maintained, continue to improve after 12 months, whereas on docetaxel you have acute toxicity during those six cycles, including life-threatening neutropenic sepsis. Um, so this man, I would not consider docetaxel for the above uh, reasons mentioned. Okay. If uh, will I go on to the next patient, if that's okay? So this is a very similar scenario, but slightly different in terms of the burden of disease. So we've got a 61-year-old man. He presented with some back pain. He was again very fit, malignant, feeling prostate. Uh, clinically, he didn't have any signs of a cord compression. His PSA was 300. Uh, we did an urgent MRI scan, despite clinically not being convinced that he had cord compression. He did have some spinal meds, but no cord compression. So, uh, Sumit, if I can request you to come here, this was his bone scan. Yeah, so here we can see in the bone scan there are extensive skeletal metastasis involving uh, both the axial and the appendicular skeleton and the skull. So this is uh, like quite extensive metastatic disease. Okay. Would you call this a super scan, uh, Sumit? Yeah, we call this a super scan because we don't see the background activity and neither the kidneys. So it's a super scan. 
Okay, fine. So this we 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 agreed with you. He had a CT scan as well. On a CT scan, he had some pelvic lymphadenopathy, uh, but no visible meds. So by all definitions, this was a high volume metastatic disease, T three A N one M one B staging. So again, I'll come to the same questions again. Uh, Ash, choice of hormones here. So this is a bit clearer. So, uh, so he's got impending spinal cord compression, I guess, in view of the fact that he's got back pain, fairly extensive uh, bone metastatic disease, and a high PSA of 300. Um, so I think he should be probably put forward for LHRH antagonists uh, or bilateral subcapsular or cadectomy, if that's uh, what he prefers. Uh, okay. LHRH agonist would probably be contraindicated in this case because of the risk of testosterone flare. Uh, I'd like to now, uh, Marco, Marco, would you biopsy this man? Do you think a biopsy is necessary or is the diagnosis quite clear? Uh, I, I think I, I think the diagnosis is really clear, it's obvious, um, but he is quite young. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would probably consider him for a biopsy really, um, just on the basis that you want to know maybe the the grade and what what's happening in terms of biology. Um, in the future, there might be possibility to enroll him in a trial or something like that. So it doesn't really alter maybe his immediate management, but, but might be uh, useful in the future. Okay, so I, uh, we, we did biopsy him and our primary yeah was that he was a young fit man and we we wanted to keep ourselves open to uh, recruitment into any trials would the panel agree with that yeah it would be interesting uh, to, to to know about um, uh, genetic mutations in this patient as well and like BRCA1 BRCA2 uh, what uh, perhaps mentioned earlier um, to counsel him for his um, uh, his sort of extended family as well and PSA screening perhaps down the line uh, uh, Marco, would you do a limited biopsy just for histological diagnosis, or would you do an extensive biopsy on this? Yes, I was, I was kind of thinking of that. I, I, and, and the other question would be, does he need also prostate MRI, really? Um, um, it, if he can get the prostate MRI, I would probably go mm -hmm. with a limited targeted um, biopsy. I'm not entirely sure this is according to guidelines, but I would want him to have a prostate MRI as well, and then a targeted biopsy. Okay, so we, we proceeded just with a biopsy, and again, it confir confirmed uh, high volume disease, and he's, he's had uh, a, a CT, a bone scan, and a biopsy, and based on that, he had high volume metastatic disease. Uh, again, I will come to Shea and uh, Jeshri. The choice here is again between Enza Abbey and Docetaxel. Would you have a preference in the COVID era? So um, again, this gentleman has high volume metastatic disease um, and he'd be eligible for en enzalutamide as well as Docetaxel. Enzalutamide will reduce his contact as we've discussed before with healthcare. Um, you could consider Docetaxel um, if you've co covered him with GCSF. There is some evidence that uh, giving chemotherapy within the COVID era is safe, um, but I would prefer enzalutamide uh, because it would reduce his um, contact with the healthcare system. And just also to point out that um, because he's got high volume of static disease, there would be no role for radiotherapy in his case. Fantastic. I'd like to just ask one question, and I'm not certain where the evidence stands with this. If... Uh, if you come to a situation where COVID isn't a uh, problem anymore and you can choose any upfront systemic therapy of, of uh, option of your choice in patients with uh, high volume metastatic disease, uh, what would your systemic option be? I think that's interesting. I think I would um, discuss the options um, with the patient. Um, would you, I mean, in terms of docetaxel, it's six cycles up front, and then, you know, that's it done. And zotamide is an ongoing treatment. Sure. Um, I don't know what you think, Shay. I completely agree with Jayshree. It is all boiled down to the patient in front of you. Um, for chemotherapy, in many tumor sites, 
uh, based on the trial, cutoff age is usually, usually 70. So for patients over 70 years old with comorbidity and, um, um, you know, and fitness and clinical frailty scale, which is hot off the press, then we'll consider uh, whether ENZA, RB oral treatment or um, docetaxel. Sorry, Abby is not uh, licensed in this uh, setting. And another point I have mentioned before is about quality of life. Uh, you have to consider um, whether this patient um, um, and how best to suit their lifestyle. So just, just on that point, Shay, I mean, I, it's, you said something in your talk which I th found very surprising. You said that something like 80% of all men presenting with metastatic prostate cancer in, in the United States get ADT alone and don't get offered all of these, um, you know, novel agents, whether it's Dosi or Abirenza or whatever. So what is the indication now for a man presenting with metastatic prostate cancer like this, polymetastatic disease, to just get ADT and nothing else? So this is a, a very interesting question. So 80% I quote. That's because I'm a urologist. I ask interesting questions. <laughs> Great. So the 80% uh, was a result from a, a U U.S. Uh, um, national um, kind of sensor or, or, or questionnaire from a variety of uh, healthcare um, providers. Because of the healthcare system is different, very different from the Europe and the UK, um, there's insurance implication. Therefore, a lot of insurance company would consider ADT as acceptable, curative, or you know, like um, manageable treatment options for men with metastatic prostate cancer. But the evidence has overwhelmingly over the last five to ten, uh, six years suggested that monotherapy, it does not suppress the metastatic clones um, from genomic, genomic level and also downstream, you know, mutational pathways, um, you know, to offer them the best or optimal survival uh, benefit. Um, why, why now is just a chance that all the evidence is just being emerging and uh, reported. And the apalutamide, for example, is available uh, somewhere else um, um, in, in Australia, um, but not in Spain. Every country is different, um, uh, unfortunately, but I do regard this normal ARPI or androgen pathway receptor inhibitors, they are similar class of drug with um, established similar efficacies. And so just to, to, to just answer that last point, so do you, is it now no longer appropriate for any man to only receive ADT alone who presents with metastatic disease? So this question was asked in ESMO to the expert panel. So the answer from the expert at the uh, the panel was that she offered to one man in the last 12 months he was 91 years old and frail because it's true even in uk practice where we don't have those insurance limitations there's still at least a, a large cohort of men who are only on adt alone right so we also could do better Absolutely. and if we're going to if we're going to now start offering these, system, these novel systemic agents to men present with newly diagnosed metastatic disease, then maybe all men with newly diagnosed, di diagnosed metastatic disease should be managed by oncologists, whereas currently in the UK, up and down the country, the vast majority of these men are managed by urologists in the first instance, and then only go to see oncologists later on. Isn't that correct? I think this is still, Bavan, um, you could help us with, with yeah. that as well. Yeah in terms of pathways? Yeah, I, I think this uh, really depends on uh, the dynamics, the demographics, uh, you know, and the practicalities of your individual locations. And it also depends on, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, how much of a specialist your uh, urologist is in prostate cancer. I think in the Northeast, it sits very comfortable with us where we uh, deliberately have a shared care protocol. Uh, where, you know, because of the geography of the place, it becomes more practical to run our practices this way. 
and uh, we we i mean for quality assurance in terms of upfront treatment options all our patients do go through an mdt so it is collective decision making rather than uh, individualized decision making so uh, i i think it works i think it's very difficult to have one rule that fits all uh, we've we've already seen within this uh, forum that uh, there are international variation depending on uh, you know your own local dynamics so uh, i i i i it it's it's shared care sits very comfortable with uh, with me and uh, and i have no qualms about it just one more point to make a uh, um regarding uh, the options of um treatment intensification only last year uh, when prostate cancer uh, uk um did a survey only one in four um, you know, men with metastatic, high volume metastatic um, prostate cancer patient received those attacks. So this is not a US problem, not a worldwide problem, but, um, you know, it's close to us as well. Uh, whether you're a urologist or oncologist or anybody, you have to consider this man can live up to six, seven years despite the novel presentation of metastatic disease. Just have to think carefully um, what we could optimize their care. And we are very privileged to have the MDT system in uh, the UK. I'd, I'd just like to add one more thing in terms of, you know, adding, uh, do all patients with high volume metastatic disease uh, require additional treatment apart from ADT. I think we have to take into consideration fitness levels because this is not just about improving survival. Uh, in a very elderly man who's got competing illnesses and uh, his life expectancy is poor anyway, uh, whatever survival benefit that you may have with additional treatments, he may never uh, you know, see that in his lifetime. But so in that situation, adding an additional treatment may not have that much value. You do have to add ADT in this situation to prevent metastatic related complications in those patients. Then will be a group of patients, you may not want to add additional treatment. So uh, so I don't think you, know, you, you have to add additional treatment to all patients with high volume metastatic disease. Agreed, absolutely about fitness and the benefit perceived. Okay. So I'll just go on to the next two. If there's no f further discussions on this, I'll go on to the next uh, question. Uh, radiotherapy to the prostate, I think uh, Jeshri uh, answered that earlier on. She said, this is not an option. I suspect everybody will agree with this. Uh, and surgery, I think I know what the answer is. I think it's probably not an option, but uh, uh, I'd like to hear what uh, uh, Dr. Yuvraj and Dr. and PS have to say. Dr. Yuvraj? Yeah, perfect. No question of surgery here. Yeah. P.S., would you agree with that? Absolutely. For the, I mean, I presented a similar case, right, with polymerosite disease where we tried to, to do operate and it made no difference. So absolutely, there's no there's no role for surgery. So in keeping with the panel, we did start him on Degarelix and he's on, he's only just been diagnosed and he's currently on Enza. And uh, we'll see how he goes with that. Now, this, uh, the intention behind this virtual MDT was uh, to really look at very similar patients in terms of initial presentation, but very different disease burdens and how our treatment plans vary with that. So we'll conclude our virtual MDT here, but there are some questions that have come from our audience. Uh, one is from Dr. Martin, and he asks uh, PS this question, uh, rectal examination, uh, how, how do you know if uh, you know, the prostate's been invaded or no? Uh, P.S., would you like to elaborate on that? <laughs> that's, yeah, so I mean, that's a c controversial point. Some of my colleagues uh, don't think there's any place for rectal examination in prostate cancer anymore because of the MRI, but but I still like to feel, I mean, I think when you feel, I mean, it's really hard to, you or Dr. Raj can expand better than me, but normally when you feel a prostate, when it's stuck on the rectum, you can't move the prostate off the rectum. You can, you can the rectum moves with the prostate, okay? When there's a plane between the rectum and the prostate, you may feel that the re you may feel some rectal tethering, but you can move the prostate uh, and it moves separately to the rectum. And so I think that's a quite an important indicator as to whether it's completely stuck on the rectum or not. Um, of course, all these patients, you when you operate on them before you operate on them, you'll clear the bowel with an enema anyway. But I think it is important to to check operability uh, with a rectal exam. But it's not a 
it's not an exact science by any means. And I think I, I generally would always do a rectal exam and always do an MRI and then have a think about whether I think it's operable or not. But let's hear what Dr. Yuvraj thinks. I'd, I'd agree with PS on that. Uh, I think one uh, just to follow up with that, uh, when we do a rectal examination, the question is not about prostate involvement, it's about resectability. And you know, if, when you do a rectal examination, you can get a feel for how smooth that area is. It's, it's very difficult to articulate. It's really a feel and uh, it does add that little bit more confidence uh, in terms of resectability. Dr. Yuraj, if I'd uh, ask you to yeah, comment on that. Perfect. I think uh, rectal examination is one of the most important uh, step. I think we should never miss it. Uh, you know, if anybody says that MRI is okay, then you can go and operate. I don't think any surgeon will operate without putting a finger. Uh, as uh, uh, Bhavan says, that is very difficult to tell how we feel it, but it's good so that we know that, you know, whether the, whether the cancer is spreading into the rectal wall or not. Fairly well, I think we can make out, although it may not be very specific, but we are comfortable with rectal exam. It should be a must uh, step in our clinical evaluation. Uh, I'll go to the next question. This is not so much sure in metastatic prostate cancer, but it highlights some of the controversies in lymph node dissection in high-risk prostate cancer. So this is from Dr. Dakre, and he asks, what is the definition of limited standard extended super extended lymph node dissection in the prostate? Uh, I'll, if, if everybody's happy, I'll answer that question. I think uh, the role of extended pelvic lymph node dissection in prostate cancer is, uh, very, is, 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 is debatable. It's not very clear. Uh, but an international consensus would, with, with that would be that it's an all or none. You either do an extended lymph node dissection or you don't do a lymph node dissection. And you would probably limit that to high-risk patients. And uh, the templates is at the bifurcation of the common iliacs. Uh, I know the practices are slightly variable in India because probably the uh, biology of the disease in terms of how they present is slightly different. This was this was the feedback that we received from Dr. Gagan when we spoke previously. Dr. Yuraj, what, what would your views be on that? No, I think uh, as far as lymph node dissection, so we do the, the, the same thing. So in any high-risk patients, uh, high-risk localized or local advanced prostate cancer, we do extended lymph node dissection. So we go even up to the common aliens, and most important is the internal iliac and deep obturated lymph node group of area are addressed uh, much more commonly. Uh, I think it's a, it's a standard practice what we do. Most of, most of us, we do the same thing. So can I ask a question? Maybe I can get Sumit into this. So you present some very nice data, Sumit, to show the benefit of PSMA PET in primary staging of high-risk patients. So if a, if a patient presents with high-risk prostate cancer, at least an eight, whatever, and you do a PSMA PET as you recommended, and they have no nodal metastases, then what is then is there still a benefit for doing an extended lymph node dissection? Uh, a PSMA PET CT has an excellent negative predictive value. So if it is negative, that means it is negative. There is no metas nodal metastasis. So, so therefore, you can, so therefore, therefore you can avoid. So therefore, that is against what we've just said and against what EAU guidelines are, which is that these patients get an extended lymph node dissection. So do you think we should be modifying our practice of lymphadenectomy based upon a PSMA PET? Because currently, EAU guidelines don't look at PSMA PET in, how, in their definitions of who should get a lymph node dissection and who shouldn't. There is no such uh, trial as uh, currently available to say that whether PSMA negative patients without lymph node dissection will fare well. Uh, rather, rather than going ahead with extended lymphadenectomy. So we need to compare and see. I think it, it very nicely brings it on to the next question, uh, which is my question, really. So in the era of PSMA PET scans, particularly with, in, in its role in primary staging, if you have someone with a PSMA PET scan that shows low volume metastatic disease, but conventional imaging comes back as negative, what would your strategy be if this so, yeah. has otherwise been suitable for all forms of local treatment options? Okay. So my answer this would be in, uh, I will go give an analogy for this, that uh, it's called as lead time bias. So whenever you have an uh, imaging modality, which is very sensitive, you don't know what to do with the disease you have identified so early with. So uh, let me say the patient has uh, with uh, lymph node metastasis, which is negative on conventional imaging. And uh, 
he is diagnosed today and he is going to die in the next 10 years let me say his death is on 10 years by conventional imaging you would have identified the metastasis at the third or fourth year still the patient would have died at the 10th year so you don't know whether identifying the disease earlier is going to actually uh, bring out a survival benefit so this is called as lead time bias and we need to have this in all our uh, trials which uh, you know we are conspicuously absent in all our trials second thing is uh, upstaging the patient from low volume to high volume disease again i will tell you giving an example of a thyroid cancer which is another uh, indolent uh, cancer so on advent of the technological advancement of ultrasound what uh, the worldwide started to see is that we are picking up uh, thyroid nodules which are less than 1 cm okay so that is microcarcinomas they are picking up and uh, and we don't know whether doing a total thyroidectomy on such small nodules actually gives a survival benefit so they compared this with post uh, autopsy specimens where 40% of the people who have survived lived their whole life and then died 40% have had these microcarcinomas in thyroid so we really don't know what advantage we are actually going to put in when we are identifying more disease but uh, what is the advantage of pct i would like to tell like you have to use our functional imaging modalities very uh, very nicely actually the a benefit of this is like in recurrence detection as i said the psa can be very low and you know the patient is doing well or something like that then you the psa slightly starts to rise and that is when you choose psma pet to identify a disease and you know that there is recurrence second thing is on response assessment so when you uh, when you started on let me say enzo or abi and uh, your psa drops and it's hovering at the nadir and uh, you really want to know what's happening with the disease and you do a psa pet scan all the sites previously seen are gone you are much more confident that your therapy is working so as a response uh, assessment it's uh, it has a very good value and uh, not much in upstaging so that we have to see so whether low volume disease to high volume disease any survival benefit will be there for the patient excellent very nice mate uh, ashwin i just want you to comment you said that there is uh, i think ps picked up on this as well but the role of hormones in uh, low volume intermi- or low risk intermediate risk prostate cancer uh, and you just want to put up a clarification on that ashwin would you like yeah so, so just to clarify um uh, i might have got this wrong in uh, my slide that low risk disease patients will not lo- low risk localized disease patients will not um n- need to receive adt but intermediate unfavorable risk disease and high risk localized disease they should be receiving adt when they receive radiotherapy uh, so thanks ps for picking up on that uh, just with while clarifying i just come to uh, shay on this in these group of patients what is the role of stereotactic radiotherapy to the prostate where we are now increasingly not giving them hormonal therapy this is not metastatic setting this is in uh, favorable risk intermediate risk prostate cancer so the short answer is for this group of patient prostate saver is becoming standard of care so this i concur with what ashwin just said the trial the paces b trial and the, the large scandinavian trial which has just been published last year as well or supporting um short interval high dose stereotactic um body radiotherapy to prostate so these people are um the intermediate risk gleason 3 plus 4s so the low favorable intermediate risk or low risk patient a uh, group great great group one patient so these people are um traditionally being managed either you know having radical prostatectomy or they can have 60 grain 20 which is moderately hypo hypofractionated as per chip trial but nowadays covid has accelerated the change we there are already enough evidence but it would have taken time to you know for the centers to adopt 
the good thing about COVID has brought to the, the radiation oncologist for the prostate is that um, we are fast forwarding and we are ad adapting and we are able to offer Sabre, which is five fractions um, done in a week, no hormone. Thank you very much, Shay. Shay, I, I've just been uh, told by Zishan that we, it, maybe it's time to conclude, but as always, these discussions are very stimulating. There's a lot to talk, and I think if you leave all of us together, we could speak for a very, very long time on this topic. But uh, sadly, we have to conclude. Uh, I'd like to thank all our faculty members and our speakers. I know you guys are really busy, and you know this is an is initiative I true Eurogrip, our flagship, we are very passionate about, and this is about spreading education globally. So thank you so much for joining us and supporting us. Big clap to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Uh, we'd like to also thank all our participants for taking part. Uh, uh, I have to announce that there's one person who's got all our MCQ questions correct. We were asked for the feedback we received. The last time was that the MCQ was too easy. So we thought we'd make it slightly more difficult. So the gentleman is Eduardo Enriquez from Chile. So well done. Good good on you. So a big, big round of applause. <laughs> so I'd like to thank all my colleagues from Euro, Eurogrip, iTrues, there's Zishan, there's Shiny, there's Sufyan, uh, there's Milap, there's Nitesh, and of course, Baskar. So guys, thank you so much. And uh, both Anurag uh, and Asr from uh, CIPLA, uh, thank you for a fantastic show. And uh, we, we've had a lot of requests for our webinars to be uh, played live on YouTube. We're in the process of getting all that, all the practicalities organized with this. Uh, so do bear with us. It's only a matter of time. Within the next couple of weeks, we'll have it live or we will have them available on YouTube. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you.